By popular demand, here is the first video in my series on how to make a fighting game. That's a pretty broad topic, so expect this series to go in many different directions. I think that if you just want to make a fighting game as fast as possible, I would choose Game Maker Studio. That is not a free option, however, it is extremely easy and not time consuming, if you do it right, to make a fighting game with Game Maker Studio. However, the downsides of Game Maker Studio are one, Game Maker has a huge interface that sort of hides all the inner goings on inside of it, which means that you don't have exact control over how all the data inside your game is moving around, which again makes it really easy to make the game work, but it makes it really difficult to make the game work precisely internally how you want it to work. And so a step past Game Maker Studio would be the Unity engine, which is what I will be using. The Unity engine has a little bit of fluff in between you and how the game works, but that fluff is really only put on top of certain aspects of the game. You are still required to have an external IDE for typing in your code, and the game takes that code and uses it, and that's where the fluff part is. But you can do a lot of the work outside of that fluff entirely, which makes it quite a bit more difficult to use if you don't know much about programming, but it gives you a lot more control over all the variables that you have in your game. And Unity Engine is completely free, and there are other engines that you can use as well, such as the Unreal Engine, but I've never really used Unreal Engine. I already have a pretty strong background in Unity, so that's what I will be using. If you want to make a Unity game, I would highly recommend getting the Unity Hub. So this is Unity Hub. As you can see, I already have a, a, a few projects going, but if I wanted to start a new one, I would click new, and I will, let's see, what what will I call this one? So I already have a project called Transcendence A running. I'll call the project for this series Transcendence B, and I'll start with a 2D template. Although this really doesn't matter too much from what I know. I have no idea what these do, but I know the difference between 2D and 3D is pretty tiny. It's very easy to switch between the two even after you've already created your project. So now you just sit here and wait for Unity to create your project. Ah, welcome to the Unity screen. We will become very intimately familiar with this screen in due time. But for right now, take a look up here. This is the version of Unity that I'm running. I'm running on a 2020 version, apparently. So if you're following along with me, I would recommend probably using the latest version of Unity that you can have access to. But I would also dissuade you from trying to update Unity as you work on the project, because that can introduce some problems. Just know that for this project, I am running on Unity version 2020.2.0 F1. Personal. Personal meaning it is not the paid version, it is not the professional version. So up here is your hierarchy, and over here is your inspector panel, and down here is your project panel and console, which you can click between them. And in the middle you have your scene view or your game view. So what do all these things generally mean? Well over here on the hierarchy panel, this is going to be all the things that you have in the scene, and the scene is that it's, it's like a room, it's the things that Unity loads all at once. So you might have a scene for the main menu, you might have a scene for when the match starts, you might have a scene for like playing cutscenes or something, I don't know. Just know that every time that you switch scenes, Unity has to go through a pretty long loading screen, depending on how big the scene you're loading is. The inspector panel lets you click on an item in the hierarchy, and it brings up a bunch of information about it. Now every single game object we'll have a transform, which is this window right here, and it has a position, a rotation, and a scale. Position is just where it is in the space, rotation is which direction it's facing, and scale is how big it is on each of those three axes. Since we're in 2D mode, one of these axes is not going to be very useful for us, but as you can see, if I move the camera on the X, it moves in our scene view accordingly. I can press Control Z to go back. If I move it on the Y, it goes up and down. And if I move on the Z, it's not going to look like it's doing much of anything. But if I very quickly toggle the 3D view, you can see that it's actually moving back and forth on the Z axis. But we don't want it to be in 3D mode, we want it to be in 2D mode, so let's keep it like that for now. And then the project panel will hold all the files. So this is stuff that you have on hand, ready to use, and this actually includes the scenes themselves. Notice we have the sample scene is the scene that we're editing right now. But this is basically like your file explorer for Windows. So I would recommend making new folders, which you can do by right-clicking, creating, folder. 
Uh, let's call this one scripts. So all the scripts that we're going to be making are going to be in here and all must be somewhere in the assets folder. For the most part, if something is not in your assets folder, you cannot use it in any of your scenes. So if we would ever need to import some sprites from somewhere, we would need to download them and put them in our assets folder. I have a folder somewhere on my desktop called Unity Projects. And as you can see, it has a folder for all of the projects I have. So Transcendence B assets folder. So if you wanted to import things from other websites or whatever, you would put it all in the assets folder. And then it would in turn be accessible straight from the Unity project window. And if you click on console, this will bring up an empty window. However, this is the window where Unity will talk to you. <laughs> if you have an error, then it'll show up here, or you can also tell Unity to type things to you in certain situations, which I'll get into very shortly. So as you can see, Unity always starts with a main camera object, but we're going to right click the hierarchy and click create empty. So this will create a new game object. I'm going to call it underscore GM, standing for like a game master object. This is just a generally a good thing to have in your game for each scene. And in fact, we're going to put something on it right now. I'm going to go to my scripts folder, right click, create C sharp script. For this series, we'll be using C sharp and I will call it test underscore script. And you can see that all it is is it's a file. And because we set it to be C-sharp, the file extension will be .cs. Now, when I double click this, it'll automatically open up Visual Studio. But if you want to edit this file, you can even do it directly yourself by going to Assets, Scripts. Oh, look, it made test script.cs. You can go right click it, open with, and you can choose Anything you want, you can even open it with Notepad. As you can see, it'll bring up the exact same window as my Visual Studio does, and you can type things in it from here. But I don't want to use Notepad. Basically, Visual Studio knows how C Sharp works as a programming language, and it can point out my errors if I make them. Now, obviously, Unity itself will also, like, if I just type a random word here and save it and go back to Unity, and I go to the console, it's going to be like, what? What is this? You've, you've done something that doesn't make sense. So now if I save the file back to where it was before, and then go back to Unity, it'll reload the scripts, and boom, the error is gone. If your error is not gone, by the way, you need to go to clear and make sure you have these checked. Now, having a script is all well and good, but we can tell it to do a lot of things and it won't do anything because it's not actually in our scene. If we go back to Unity in our project window, we have our script, but it's in our assets folder. It's not anywhere in the hierarchy yet. So this is why we made underscore GM was so that we can take our script and drag it onto the inspector panel. So now we have a new component on our underscore GM object, which is the script. Now, whenever you drag a script onto a game object like that, you have to make sure you have this. This little piece right here. This means extends model behavior. Now we can, we can get rid of this and it'll still work, but we can't directly put this script on top of an object in Unity anymore. So if I save it like this, and I go back, and it loads the scripts again, we're gonna have an error because we have this script on our object, but it's not extending mono behavior. So again, we put it back on, and then we save, and then it reloads the script, and now everything's fine again, if we clear it. All right, so let's talk about what can we do in this file? Well, C Sharp is an object-oriented programming language, which means we can do a lot of different things. So everything in this purple here is just given to us by Unity. And probably the most basic thing that you can do is debug.log, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, semicolon, and then in these parentheses we can put quotes, and then in these quotes we can type whatever the heck we want. And what this function will do is it'll print something to the console every time it's called. Now, if I just save it like this and go back into Unity, we're gonna see a lot of errors. So this is not how the syntax works. Now, if we go back a little bit and remember what Unity gave us at the beginning, it has these two functions called void start and void update. Void isn't important yet. I will talk about it very soon. Start means it is called before the first frame update. So this means that the very first frame that this object that this group is tied to exists, this function will be called. And 
update is called once per frame. There are other methods like void fixed update. There's a function to call whenever the object is deleted. So if I type debug.log, put in quotes, and I type in hello unity, and I save that. I go over here, we can see now that there are no errors in the console. And if we press the play button, it'll open up our game. And we can see Unity is saying hello to us down in the console. Press the play button again to quit and go back over here. Now if I type debug.log, and we'll put in lol save, go back to Unity. We put that in our update function. So now if I very quickly press play, and then stop, you can see at the very top, it says hello unity because we called it in the start function. And then it says lol a bunch of times, like 463 more times because it's saying lol every frame. For the sake of this video, we don't want to do anything every frame really. So let's just stick with the start function. So you see this green thing up here, this is a comment. It's a good idea to have comments throughout your code because they don't do anything to the script itself. But for readability, I can say greet the programmer. And this will cause the script to do nothing different. But when I come back to this later, I'll be like, hmm, what's this line of code do? Oh yeah, it greets the programmer. So when we get into more complicated, multiple lines of code working on the same type of thing, I can just write a little comment at the top saying, this is what this code does. And likewise, it's also a good idea to have comments for the entire script because we'll have several scripts throughout our game that do different things. And you'll notice if I type three slashes, it'll automatically fill in this big summary page for me. So this is test script, the test script, to show off the basics of C sharp programming in this video series about making a fighting game. Exclamation point, it's going to be line. Because why not? So now that we have everything pretty well set up, we can actually start talking about variables. So if I say I want uh, an int, which means a number or an integer, and I can call it my favorite number and put a semicolon. Hmm. So now what this has done is it has allowed C sharp to know, hey, I'm going to set aside some data on this PC to hold an integer value. And actually, if I wanted to, I could say equals three or two. I type two instead of three. But it's actually a pretty good idea to say my favorite number on a different line, two semicolon, just to sort of reinforce that it's actually doing two different things here. So this pair of two lines is doing the exact same as this single line. It is doing the exact same thing, but be sure to keep in mind that it is actually doing two things. It is setting aside a place in memory to hold an integer value, and it is also assigning a value to that place in memory. Now I can also go down here and say my favorite number equals five, and it will change the value internally. But what I can't do is I can't say int my favorite number is five, because then we're trying to set aside two different places in memory because we're trying to declare two different variables, but we've given the variable the same name. So later on, if you try to say, oh, my my favorite number is three, it doesn't really know which one to do. You're not allowed to call two different variables the same name. So let's get rid of that line. And let's go ahead and get rid of this as well. And down here we can say debug.log my favorite number is space and then after the quotes we can say plus and then say i want to print the value that is in this variable right here and if we save that and go to unity we'll clear our console and then we can click play and you can see here it says hello unity my favorite number is two so this is a very basic example of printing out the value of a variable now we can do operations on this as well we can say my favorite number equals two plus two. And now if we save this, it'll be like, okay, it's four now. But my favorite number is four. We can say my favorite number is five times 
through two, and then click play. Five times two would be 10, so my favorite number is 10. And if you wanted to get really crazy, we can even go into our update method and say my favorite number equals my favorite number plus one. And you can think about what this might do, and you're probably very close to right. But if you save and go to Unity, you'll see something very interesting happen. And then it's that we get an error. So what is the error? The, the name my favorite number does not exist in the current context. Well, what does this mean? It means that when it gets to here, it tells you test script.cs line 26. So line 26 is this one. Okay, so there's an error here. What's the error? It says, oh, I can't find this thing. It can't find this. What is this? Okay, so this brings up the idea of scope. When I made this variable, I made it in the start method. And the start method and the update method are separate unconnected methods, which means that the update method doesn't really know anything about the start method, which means it doesn't know what this is. It can't find it. So what we can do is we can go outside of the methods and say int my favorite number and stop there and then go over here. And now instead of declaring the variable in the start method, we are instead setting it to a certain value in the start method. And now if I save and go back into Unity, you will find that all the errors are now gone. Now, in order to understand scope, all you gotta do is look at the brackets. So notice this bracket, you can see when I click on it, it actually highlights this bracket down here as well. So these brackets are connected. And if I highlight this bracket, you can see these are connected and then these are connected. And this works with other things too, like this open parenthesis, I can click on that and it highlights the end of the parentheses. So these brackets represent a scope. If I declare my favorite number within the start method, as soon as the script reads through this and is like, okay, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. As soon as it leaves the scope of the start method, it drops all variables that I made in the start method. However, because I am now making the value up here, it doesn't drop this variable until the very bottom, which means that now this variable exists both in the start function and in the update function. And now if we take this and move it down here, well, let's think about what it's going to do here. It's going to first start with this. This method will be called and say hello unity, and it'll set the value of the variable to be 10. And once it goes down here, every frame, it'll be like, okay, this number equals whatever it was before plus one. So it's going to add one to the value of the variable, and then it's going to print this. So if we go into Unity and click play, you can see crazy stuff happens. I'm going to close out real, really, really fast and go to the top here just to see what happened. So it prints out 11 because it already adds one before our first debug.log down here. However, it would start at 10 if you put this up here like this, because then it would run the debug.log first and then add one, but we had it like this. And then as you can see, every single frame, it goes through and it adds one and it adds one and it adds one and it adds one. And just in a matter of like two or three seconds that we ended up with what, 866. So let's keep exploring what we can do with these operations. What if I do six divided by two? And then we say debug.log, my favorite number is plus my favorite number, save unity. Now we expect it to tell us that my favorite number is three, and indeed it does. So, okay, six divided by two is three. We can also subtract, and we can even go through and add several steps of mathematical operations and say six minus two times three. This one's a little bit tricky. I believe it's going to give us a zero. It says zero, so indeed it is following the rules of PEMDAS where it multiplies first and then subtract, so it says, okay, two times three is six, six minus six is zero. If we wanted to do it the other way, we would put parentheses around these, just like PEMDAS. So now by doing this, it'll subtract the two from the six first and say four times three is 12. So if you save that, go into Unity, it'll say 12, yep. And great, that's all very basic operations with integers.